Satan. And the first is uh, Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 4, and then skips to <laughs> verses 12 through 28, uh, if you want to follow along. And we continue with the story of the patriarchs, right? This, this is the story of the beginnings of the chosen people of God. And chapter after chapter after chapter is another uh, facet of the dysfunction which uh, exhibits in, in God's chosen, maybe even amongst God's chosen still today. Um, so let us listen to uh, what the Spirit is saying to us as we, as we come together. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are you not your brothers, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. <clears throat> so Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance. And before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, they, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew jo Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. And we continue in, Ma in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, 
he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. So, I, um, <clears throat> I got up uh, early Monday morning this week, is, is my, uh, my practice, and um, <clears throat> engaged in my usual uh, spiritual practice, eagerly, uh, looking forward to it. It's the way I uh, find spiritual food uh, which is uh, in great need, particularly in these times. So my practice is to uh, first uh, read prayerfully, meditatively a passage of Scripture. I'm going through the book of Isaiah uh, these days. And then next I, uh, I chant uh, five psalms. Uh, and I just go, you know, one through 150 and keep uh, repeating. So it takes me about a month to get through the Psalter this way. And, and then I spend 20 minutes of uh, emptying myself, of just letting go whenever my attention gets drawn into a thought. Um, and, uh, and then sometimes I'll do another exercise, um, sometimes not. But then I look forward to um, beginning to meditate on the scripture for the week, these two passages that I just shared. And what I find frequently is that um, when, when you prepare yourself, right, when you really let go, uh, try to quieten, you know, bring stillness um, so that you can listen, right, more deeply, that there's uh, oftentimes a, a, a birth of creativity. You know, that, that's really where creativity comes. Uh, prayer is meant to be deep listening to life so that we can see more, hear more, uh, be, be more deeply present to what is always there, but that sometimes we're so distracted we're not present to. Uh, and frequently the sermons kind of write themselves in that, in that, um, in that setting. Uh, but that wasn't happening Monday. Um, I sat there and uh, nothing, it's just nothing, right? Nothing wanted to be spoken to me, through me in that, that moment. So I started to read. So I, I, I'm reading through various mystics, um, which it feeds the soul, but it's also very challenging. These mystics are not easy reading, intellectually or spiritually speaking. Um, and, and so then I turned to Facebook. <laughs> And uh, I came across an article that uh, caught my eye. It was uh, written by uh, a professor of Christian ethics at uh, a Mercer University. I'm not familiar with the university. And the article was called Winning the War Between Keeping the Peace and Telling the Truth. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that sounds pretty interesting. So he begins um, the article by uh, uh, reflecting on an article that he had written in 2006 in Christianity Today magazine, which is an evangelical Christian magazine. And in the article, as a Christian ethicist, he was saying 
that the Christian position is um, is not in favor of torture of terrorists. You know, you remember back in those days when that was an issue. And he just went through the New Testament uh, why he believed that Christians should not be in support of the use of of torture uh, and terrorists. So some time passes, and I think he's, uh, if I remember the article correctly, he's he's lecturing at another uh, college, and he's he's lecturing on a completely different topic, and it comes time for question and answer period, and a male student stands up and he's clutching the 2006 uh, Christianity Today magazine in which his uh, torture article was in, and. This male student was very angry. In fact, um, the professor said that there was a look in his eyes uh, that gave him pause. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> come across someone who had a look in their eyes that you were like, uh-oh, be careful here. And so the, the student said uh, that, he said, I'm a Christian and I totally support the use of torture against terrorists. Whatever we have to do, I'm all for. And then he looked at the professor he, and he said, I want you to look me in the eyes and tell me that I am not a Christian. <laughs> well, the professor was like, he was frightened. And uh, he gulped and he said, um, you know, I still stand by what I wrote in the article that um, Jesus' teachings do not support, in my opinion, uh, the use of terror or torture. But he said, uh, as for your relationship with Christ, he says, uh, that's a, I'm in no position to judge. That's a matter between, between you and Christ. And that seemed to work okay. There was no, at least, violence. It ended, it, it, it ended the, the, the energy a little bit in, in the room. And he reflected on that saying he didn't really feel uh, satisfied in his answer. And then he went on to uh, reflect about how all of us uh, face this all the time, right? Do we, in our relationships with people, right? Uh, do we wanna keep the peace? Do we wanna tell the truth? And he reflects that none of us feel really comfortable uh, about how we navigate these stormy waters in our cultural context. Um, you know, if you're like me, um, if, if I don't say something, you know, I don't feel good. I feel like I'm not uh, fulfilling my responsibility as a Christian leader in the moment, in our time. But if I say something, I, I, don't feel, I don't feel like I'm moving the needle forward at all. Sometimes I feel like I just make matters worse. And so, um, you know, we don't really know how to respond uh, to, to the moment. Uh, actually, I think that uh, this professor's response was, was about as good as you can do. He, he told the truth as he saw it without condemning the other person. And, and I think that's really about as good as we can, can do. But what was most interesting to me in this article was the reaction of the male student, how um, attached he was to his identity as a Christian, his own rightness, and how injured he was, how angry he was by having that uh, challenged by this uh, professor. Um, and it's like we live in a world, um, and maybe you're like me, where uh, it, it seems like Christian identity uh, so often in our country shows up in ways that are the exact opposite of what we see in Jesus, you know? Can you imagine Jesus uh, being ready to punch somebody in the face because he was insulted by their point of view? Uh, in fact, Jesus does the exact opposite, right? And, and so here's Jesus, and it seems like we, we turn Christianity 
into something that is the exact opposite of what Jesus lived and taught. And so Jesus, this, this uh, exemplar and messenger of nonviolence, you know, gets used by Christians to support the use of violence. Or Jesus, this one who came proclaiming the message of forgiveness, that God is a, a God of forgiveness and love, and that honestly we can only receive forgiveness as we give forgiveness to others. We, we so often turn that around into the message, the Christian message of God as uh, a God of judgment. Or, um, you know, this, this Jesus who warned us about the corrupting influence of money, warned us against greed, how it, it, it diverts us from um, our journey towards God, or so easily can and how Jesus constantly uh, lifted up the poor and, and warned, um, um, you know, those who were of means. And how we, in our, in our country, you know, just sort of seem to be so at peace with extreme uh, income inequality and how we so frequently demonize uh, the poor and justify the interests of those who have the most. You know, as I said in my daily practice, I'm, I'm chanting five psalms, and right now I'm reading through the book of Isaiah. And I have to tell you, almost every morning, almost every morning, there is a passage which says that God judges in favor of the poor. And woe to those, you know, who are comfortable and are not taken care, who, who have shut down their hearts. I was in a conversation this week about, you know, well, what's going to happen with uh, as Congress is at an impasse and all the politics of that. And, and then it, was, it quickly goes to a, a, a place of fear. You know, okay, we have uh, this deficit that continues to increase. And I, get, I totally understand it. I, 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 I firmly believe we're on, a, on an unsustainable path. And yet, if our conversation is only about numbers, if it's only in our heads, if we're not listening to the stories, you know, I was listening to a story this morning on the news of a, of a single mom with uh, children, uh, you know, faced with all kinds of, you know, uh, unbelievable decisions. You know, how do we as Christians bring a different quality to the conversations, the realities that, that face us all? And I think what really jumped out at me in this, again, in this article, is how the, at the core, I believe, of Jesus' teaching is his message that we we need to die to our our identification, our attachment with uh, the story of me, my own rightness, the defensiveness and judgment that comes with that, and it's really based in fear, I believe, and to die to that, so that we can show up in a completely different way and change the energy of our interactions with others and, and, uh, and begin to change uh, the energy of the community in which we live. So instead of this idea of how dare you challenge my identity as a Christian, you know, the posture of Jesus and his teachings and of all the great saints has been, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And until we're in that posture, what Jesus teaches us is there's no authentic gateway into the presence of God. If we're in a, def a self-righteous, defensive posture, we're cutting ourselves off from the mercy and the grace and the love of God that includes us all. And that when we're really waking up, what we see is all the blocks within us that keep us from God and keep us from being uh, messengers and um, instruments of God's healing work in, in the world until we're in that authentic place of Lord have mercy on me a sinner forgive me so that I can show up in compassion and forgiveness 
uh, for others. And so, you know, um, as I think, I thought more deeply, and I thought really deeply about this topic of, okay, uh, keeping the peace or telling the truth. It began to dawn on me that, that maybe this is not the right frame. That it's just another dualistic frame that keeps us uh, locked in a position that's not very transformative. That um, there's another way, a deeper way uh, to show up. And I think that that's what the story that we read of Jesus walking on the waves is, is really pointing to. All of these stories uh, serve us the best when we read them uh, symbolically. Uh, if it's just a miracle story, and it, and it can function on that, I, I'm not doubting that. Uh, how, does it, how does it make a difference as we're facing the storms of our own lives? Because there's a lot of storms in our own lives, right? Uh, and uh, I experienced that anew this week, as I'm sure you did. Uh, my story was waking up on Tuesday morning uh, at about 3 o'clock and, and hearing some rustling, I thought, upstairs and a squeaking sound. and. I was sticky because I hadn't taken a shower, so but finally 3.30, I say, I'm going to go take a shower, and I do, and I come back, I turn the light on in my bathroom, I'm getting dressed, and I see a bat flying uh, right into my face. <laughs> now, that may not sound like a big deal, but I got to tell you, your parasympathetic uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, nervous system really fires up when that is coming at you. And it is really hard to do spiritual practice when your parasympathetic nervous system is fired like that. It really is. Um, it took me a day at least before I began to be able to find spiritual center. So it's, it's one thing to talk about spiritual practice, which is what I talk about week after week after week, I get it. And maybe the teaching for me this week, because Roseanne, as I, I went upstage, says, oh, you're going you're gonna to attract some great stuff this week. You know, so she has this story, you attracted this bad. And I'm just like, shut up. <laughs> I love you, but be quiet. <laughs> but in some sense, maybe there was that, that as a spiritual teacher, you know, I need to experience the, the humbling reality of what it means to be a human being like that, I can be um, completely thrown off the center, like that. So, you know, all the trauma that all of us are experiencing on a daily, weekly basis. The storm must have brought up trauma. You know, if I'd been here, I'm sure it would have brought up a, a, past trauma. You, those of you who have been around for a long time know that my first summer here 22 years ago, my first night here, a, a tree crashed and, and totaled the, my wife's uh, car. And um, I remember it was, I think, Labor Day weekend that same year, 1998. There was another one of those storms and another couple of trees in, in uh, the, the church grounds uh, went over, you know. And my sons, who were nine and seven at the time, were trembling. I probably was trembling too, but I was too busy being, you know, the strong man to know how much I was trembling. You know what I mean? It's just these traumas come up over and over again. And with COVID, you know, even though we may be feeling like pretty good about what's going on with us, um, there's all these different, you know, demands on us with this and decisions that that come with us. I, was ta I called my brother this week and he was driving back from Indi Indiana up at, a, at um, his wife's family, he had a wedding, right? And it's in Indiana, New Jersey, this couldn't happen. They had a reception with 150 people indoors where they were dancing. I'm thinking to myself, my Lord, are you kidding me? I didn't say anything, I zipped it. And they're going back, and he said, yeah, we're going to have to be quarantined for seven or 14 days before we can see our granddaughter again, who was just born in, in June. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, man. And it's not to make any, anybody wrong in this. I mean, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's just we live collectively in this shared reality in which we're all at different places, and we just, what do we do with it all? It's much more traumatic than we're probably even aware of. So I, I, I woke up to, with a dream this morning. <laughs> it's 
It's a really strange dream. So I'm, I'm sitting in church, right, getting ready to do worship. And all of a sudden, people started showing up. Some of you and, and a lot of people who are strangers. And, and all of a sudden, we just start doing church, right? And, and it was really cool. It worked really great. People were so, so happy. And then we were talking afterwards and uh, enjoying each other's presence so much. And then I realized, oh my gosh, we, we didn't do any protocol. There were no masks. And, you know, we're going to be meeting in about 10 days. We're going to be doing protocol. I was like, oh, man, that's really crazy. We got we to gotta get our pro protocol in order. So the next Sunday, the church was just packed. And some of us were wearing masks and some of us weren't. And people were just so happy. And, uh, you know, I was having to talk over people who were having their own conversations amongst themselves. And then I woke up. And I was trying to say, what is that about? And, you know, I wrote recently about how much I've enjoyed the solitude of worship coming in here, just being totally focused on worship. And what I experienced this morning was kind of another uh, feeling of sadness. Sadness of the, of the personal interaction. Uh, you know, the quick little conversations of where we touch base with each other, you know, where we look into each other's eyes in a, in a different way. And how much I miss that. <laughs> how much um, we lo we've, we've lost. Even as important and as meaningful as this virtual worship has been for me, there's an element of being gathered in person um, that I miss. So here we are, right? Um, and I think what this parable, and I call it a parable, it's a story, but it's a lived parable of Jesus walking on the waves, the, the disciples being stuck in a boat, they, the, the wind and the waves are against them, and they're lost, and they're frightened. And Jesus comes walking to them, and they can't even begin to take it in. They think it's a ghost. They're, they're terrified. Only Peter has the guts to say, hey, is it you? Can I come and join you? And for a minute, it works for him. And then, then he pays attention to what's happening. He says, what is, <laughs> I must be crazy. And then he sinks, and Jesus saves him. And that's really a parable of all of our spiritual practice. It really is. Um, we're going to have days where we wake up to something unexpected and we're just going to be uh, crying out in fear. And yet our spiritual practice is to keep um, practicing letting go to a deeper place, to that place where Christ is the truest part of who we are. And you know, as long as we get seduced and staying only on the surface level, um, you know, we won't be able to break through into something new and deep and healing. So again, back to the story of telling the truth or keeping the peace, that's, that's no longer what really pulls primarily at my heart. Um, you know, I, I'm a peace keeper, keeper by, by nature. And I've, I've learned over the years how that both can be a gift and how it can also um, not be. It can be inauthentic. And it can be a way of not truly serving myself or others, and, and particularly in my role as a pastor. And so I'm learning more and more to see that in myself, that desire to keep the peace, but not to be dominated by it, you know, to, to really listen to that Christ's presence as best I can and, and to act from that. And as far as telling the truth is concerned, um, you know, that's certainly important. We're, we're called to, to live into the truth, you know, to, particularly out of conscience and to tell the truth. And sometimes I feel led to take a, a risk in the pulpit and to speak perhaps a hard truth but you know 
I also feel that it's not my calling uh, uh, to, to limit truth to just political truth, particularly as we defined it in our dualistic uh, you know, party system. Being faithful to Christ doesn't necessarily mean weighing in on absolutely every issue, uh, every debate, every tweet, right? You, you get it? I mean, to me, if, if we feel like we have to weigh in on everything, then we're just always going to be stuck at the surface where the winds and the waves will keep us uh, divided and angry and fearful. We'll be at the mercy of the storms, just as the disciples were. So it's up to each one of us to discern, to listen. But in order to really discern, we've got to practice on a daily basis, getting ourselves to that place. There is a place in us. There is something or someone in us that no matter what is going on is not in a place of fear and anger and reactivity. It's not always easy to find it. It took me a good day or two to find it after a bat showed up into my life. And I'm not always there. But if we can t taste into that, you know, take a walk in the woods, take a walk on the beach, um, cook a meal, have a conversation, call someone, whatever it is, read something, watch a, a great video or, or movie, something that'll open you up to the deepest part, the most Christ-like part of you, and then practice, then Maybe if we can come into the winds of the world out of that place, we might really have something uh, helpful to offer. And it might be costly to us. Maybe that's what's being called to us. I don't know. I can't answer that for you. I can't a even answer that for me, except the best I can do is discern to the moment and respond to that deepest presence, that Christ in me. And from there, do our best to be Christ in the world. May it be so, sisters and brothers, in these uh, extraordinary times, uh, peace of Christ be in us and with us and through us all. Amen.